Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name's Alistair Roth. I'm the Executive Director of AAA in Victoria, and it's great to have you with us. We've got strong interest. We've got at least 150 people dialing in. Uh, we've got members from AAA Victoria, from branches all around Australia, and other guests. So thank you very much for all your interest. Uh, very brief housekeeping before we start. We'll take questions after about 40 minutes. You're probably well aware by now you can type questions in the Q&A tab and the, the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, and you can upvote on questions posed by other people. So today is the next instalment of Richard Iron's acclaimed In Conversation series. To discuss the topic of ending war, lessons from Somaliland, we're joined by Dr. Sarah Phillips. Sarah is Associate Professor of International Security and Development at the University of Sydney. She focuses on international intervention in the global south, on state building, on non-state governance. And to do that, she's carried out extensive field work on the Arabian Peninsula and in the Horn of Africa. She's very widely published. She's written three books. And her latest, which has just been published, and which we'll discuss today, is When There Was No Aid, War and Peace in Somaliland. Now, the publishers have kindly agreed that everyone who's registered today gets a 30% discount. There's a flyer here that explains all the details, and we'll attach that when we send out the link to the recording in a couple of days' time. So you all be able to buy the book. Richard Iron is well known to most of you both from his role as a council member of AAA Victoria, and obviously from previous instalments of his conversations with, uh, with a range of interesting people. Um, prior, to the, prior to that, he was with the British Army for 37 years and based all around the world. He was a visiting fellow at the University of Oxford in the Changing Character of War program, and he is, was the lead editor of a book called British generals in Blair's wars. Anyway, thank you both very much for joining us. And I'll hand across to you, Richard. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, uh, most of our conversation uh, this evening uh, will be exploring why Somaliland has managed to find and sustain peace uh, when the rest of Somalia clearly hasn't. Um, and I'll then ask you what we're going to, uh, what we can learn, if anything, for some of the world's other seemingly intractable conflicts. Uh, but first, uh, I think we need a bit of background about Somalia and Somali land, both history and geography. So can we start there? Sure. Thanks very much, Richard and Alistair, for, for hosting me today. Um, uh, yeah, just Sorry, just bear with me. It's put you into... There we go. Sorry about that. Little Zoom issues. Um, yeah, thank you very much for hosting me. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and to see so much interest in, in this topic. So as you can see from the, the map here, Somalia really forms this sort of seven shaped part of East Africa. It's, it um, butts up against the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea and it sits right across from Yemen. And Somaliland is the section that is up the, in the northwestern corner. Now, Somaliland was more peripheral to the British Empire than the rest of Somalia was to the Italian Empire. So from Puntland down to the south had been colonized by the Italians. The Italians were by all accounts more brutal in their destruction of local governance structures, which is not to say that the British were not violent and self-serving, just that they ran um, the protectorate of Somaliland at a bit more of a distance than the Italians did because their main interest in holding territory in Somaliland was in supplying livestock and meat to Aden just across the Red Sea, which was used to supply the colony in India. Now, Somaliland, as I'm sure some of you probably know, has never been recognized as a sovereign entity by any other state in the international community. Now, they did hold independence for five days back in 1960. And this five days has reached, I would say, almost mythical status. When, you, when, you're, when you're in Somaliland, people talk about it um, as something that can, uh, was you know, once very important and can be reinvigorated because it legally held um, status as a state. 
uh, it had recognition from 34 UN members um, before it voluntarily united five days later with the Republic of Somalia. By most accounts, the union was pretty quickly regretted by those in the north of the country. And by 1969, you had a military uh, dictatorship or a military um, officer, General Syed Bade, overthrow the civilian government. And this began sort of 30 years, just over 30 years of military dictatorship, which all went particularly badly in the northwestern corner of the country where the Isaq clan that formed the majority of residents there experienced increasingly brutal treatment at the hands of the regime, which culminated in a bombing campaign in 1998 that's remembered pretty widely by Somalilanders as having been a genocide. So, of course, um, brutality was never something that prevented a dictator from receiving largesse from, the, um, from either side during the Cold War. But by the time the government of Siad Bare collapsed in early 1991, Somalia had become the largest per capita recipient of aid in Africa. I mean, that's, that's excluding the tiny little states like uh, Gambia or Djibouti. But in the main, it had become the largest per capita recipient of aid in Africa, which is a pretty, um, there's some pretty steep competition for that, as you might imagine. And it had held this position since Siad Bare swapped sides in the Cold War. He was initia initially affiliated with the Soviet Union, but then in 1978, for a, a series of reasons I won't get into, they swapped sides to the US. And it's really then at the extraordinary levels of Western economic and military aid start flooding into the country, propping up the, the government in the 1980s. Bare was finally ousted in 91, and by May of that year, Somaliland declared its independence, which, as I said, has never been formally recognised by any other state. Now, as the war waged on in the South in the early 90s, which is quite famous, this is a story that, that many people already know and that has been sort of immortalised, at least to a, a Western audience of my kind of vintage you know, through the movie Black Hawk Down, the level of violence that was going on in the North that we don't really hear that much about was actually probably even worse. So it was by no means a foregone conclusion that Somaliland's claim of independence was going to put it in any better position than the rest of Somalia. So I'm sure we'll get into this in a little while, but um, just to foreshadow here that Somaliland's wars in the 1990s, 91 to 96 to be precise, were ended largely, I mean, obviously it's more complex than this, but just let me put it broadly here and then we can drill down. It was ended largely by, I think, two headline processes. One of them was the large clan-based conferences that occurred over uh, quite a number of years and that brought huge numbers of delegates together to negotiate a settlement. Um, and this happened in fits and starts and it was disrupted by conflict and then it would restart. Um, the other one was President Egal's use of loans from the country's wealthiest merchants to buy back arms from the warring clan-based militias, and then ultimately reintegrate these mobilized members back into or into a nascent national army. So, um, so if, if, before we move on to, or sorry, move on to more detail on how Somaliland reached peace, can we explore a little bit more uh, about Somalia? and how it has just fallen apart. You know, why has it disintegrated into war? And why has it proven so impossible um, for the international community help, to help to bring this to an end? Well, I think that the most significant difference between Somalia and Somaliland, and the one that I really draw out in the book, and that's just obvious from its title, is the nature of the international presence in both places. So at the moment, we've had 18, or it's possibly, possibly more now, I lose count, at least 18 international conferences that have tried to bring peace to Somalia. And these have tended to be pretty hasty affairs. They're usually a few days, sometimes up to a week or slightly more, but they're, they're quick, right? And Somalis tend to be pretty poorly represented to them compared to the number of delegates that go from other countries. Um, as I said before, this was not the case for Somaliland, but I'm going to get into that a little more later. Let's focus here on, on Somalia. Um, in the 1990s, there was about $4 billion that the US and the UN put into the country in trying to, to stabilize and end the, end the war there. 
what this did though was it contributed to a very profound conflict economies so you had international food agencies actually becoming parties to the conflict because they were paying belligerents for either protection or for humanitarian access and in doing this they provided and this is a pretty common story right but in doing this they provided pretty extraordinary opportunities for extortion and they really established food aid as an alternative currency, as Aisha Ahmed puts it. And so this really lays the cornerstone for a very pervasive conflict economy. Um, to the point and did the, and did the food aid also undermine the local agricultural economy? Absolutely. And this is one of the most, the biggest complaints that you will hear from, or it's one of the many, but it's certainly a headline complaint that you hear from groups like a Shabab that they they viscerally hate the wfp because it is seen that they were dumping food aid into somalia at times when somalia's agricultural production and sales should have been the highest so it all contributes to this sense that not only is it entrenching a conflict economy but it's also undermining the ability of somalis to produce their own food and sustain an agricultural industry so this this point of differentiation around external assistance packages is just so deeply scored into Somaliland's discourse about how its peace process succeeded where Somalia's failed. So if we sit then under this broad differentiation about the international presence and the conflict economies that it helped to entrench, um, I think there's a few specific things that international actors got pretty wrong in, in the very early days. And the first one was they really profoundly misunderstood clan structures. And by misunderstanding them, they helped to almost reconstruct them, redraw them by sort of um, breathing life into a newly imagined version of what a clan really was. So Somalia's clan structures, and this goes for both um, Somalia and Somaliland, I mean, it was, um, the, yet yeah, the, the system remains the same they're often understood as being pretty rigid and unchanging, whereas actually they're quite flexible. I mean, they, they can be extremely flexible. And this was a point that gets lost on most international interveners, particularly the UN in the 1980s. And what they did as well was they tended to concentrate resources in the major cities. And this is something that happens all the time. Like it's major cities are easier to access, particularly for foreigners. The transport links are better. The, you know, the general resources are, are better. And so what that does though is it provides an incentive for clan elders to relocate out of their local areas. And what this does is it alters the connection between the elders in the local communities that they were claiming to represent. And Peter Little, who's a, a great researcher who's done a fair bit of work on this, he talks about the way that terms like indigenous, clan, traditional, all become increasingly used by Somalis in their written statements because they understand that this is language that resonates well with external actors and external actors who want to be seen to be engaging with leaders who they believe are powerful and locally legitimate. So what you get is that as the international presence in southern Somalia increases, you have international agencies adopting this clan idiom. And so they start to receive proposals from so-called elders, even though some of these were really just disguised militia heads. And Peter Little did a fair bit of research on this. And he said that um, in 1994, he counted more than 28 um, separate clan and sub-clan identities in an area where just 10 years earlier, or no, I think seven years earlier, he'd identified less than 10. So you see this burgeoning of, of clan, um, proclaimed clan identity. And this was something that, that I heard even in 2012 when I was in Somaliland and talking to people who had just been involved in an international conference in Istanbul. And this person told me that people, you know, really quickly saw what was going on, that they were expected to be tribal elders. And so they don the hats of tribal elders because that's the language that they realized that the donors are using. Another, yeah. Sorry. Well, another another point um, just about that 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 difference between um, north and, and south of Somaliland and the rest of Somalia is that there was the UN had this really striking preoccupation, particularly throughout the 90s. But you could say that it's also continuing. They, they don't recognize Somaliland as an independent entity. Um, 
a really striking preoccupation with maintaining a unitary state with Mogadishu as the capital. And actually, as Somalilanders were struggling at the most to bring the violence in the north under control, UNISOM II, which was the United, Station, uh, United Nations mission in Somalia, actually played actors who involved in this peace process against one another, basically an attempt to try to bring all peacemaking efforts back to Mogadishu and under UN auspices. So UNISOM starts financially supporting spoilers to go in and build support um, for a federal system of government in Mogadishu by sponsoring these smaller fringe conferences and in doing so, they endangered the larger and much more inclusive peace processes that were underway at the same time. And people have said that this is widely believed to have exacerbated the violence in, in the north, in, uh, by which I meant Somaliland in the 90s. Now, in Somalia, the, the UN has um, really sort of subcontracted, if that's the right term, um, the uh, external um, security assistance uh, to Somalia, to the African Union. Um, and the forces now, the African Union mission in, in Somalia, Amazon. Now it's sort of a very much more regionally based force uh, rather than, you know, from completely to out, out, of, uh, out of the region. Are they, is it a more nuanced approach or are they just making the same mistakes as uh, we did 20, 30 years ago? It is a more nuanced approach, that's, that's fair to say. But at the same time, it is still, there is still the, well, the Somaliland hasn't been uh, recognised, that's one. And so there is still this desire to deal with it as being one country, which creates all sorts of problems on the ground because the Somaliland um, governing authorities refuse to accept that. But also there is just this, uh, I mean, fatigue isn't even a strong enough word. There is just a sense of despair that Somalia is still experiencing so much intervention from outside and that constrains what they're able to do locally, um, politically as well. Um, I mean, the, the Somalia, of course, has had or has and has had you know, a number of uh, serious problems, one of which um, is it's been the home for quite a long time until recently uh, of uh, piracy in off the Horn of Africa. Um, now, from my background, um, criminality of which piracy is part generally tends to occur in what you know, we used to call ungoverned space, you know, rather like the tri-border area in, in, in South America between Argentina, Brazil and, and, and Paraguay, where lots of organised crime groups crime group because there, there's no government space. Is this actually what happened in Somalia, that piracy was just a response to you know, inability to govern the area, or actually is there something more profound going on, or was there more something more profound going on? So that, that's an interesting question. Um, what we found in Somalia, uh, in, in one instance, is that the areas of Puntland, which is sort of a, it's, it's neighbours um, neighbors Somaliland, it's sort of up the north um, of, of Mogadishu, that's where you had most of the piracy occurring. And actually the level of governance was a bit better there than it was in southern Somalia because lo and behold, pirates, rather like terrorists, find that it's actually pretty difficult to operate when there is absolutely no sort of political control. So having a not a completely ungoverned space is actually more beneficial for criminal entities like pirates uh, to, to operate. You need some level of control. Um, but as to whether this was a solely local Somali specific problem, no. Um, piracy in Somalia initially emerged at least partly out of the marginalization of Somalia in the global community. So there's a long history to it, which I obviously don't have too much time to get into now, but part of the initial justification that was used by people who were um, boarding ships and calling for ransoms was initially that they were protecting Somali's international waters from illegal fishing by the international communities that the international community was doing nothing about and also against illegal toxic waste dumping. So when the tsunami hit in Christmas of 2004, you just had a tremendous amount of toxic waste, even nuclear waste, um, coming up onto the shores of Somalia, which just proved what everybody knew, that these were areas that were um, being abused and preyed upon by, um, by 
by international, uh, by other states. And so there was this narrative about the need for a Somali Coast Guard to be formed to protect uh, the local fishing industry and also protect from, from dumping. And around about the turn of the century, you had a British private military contractor, Heart Security, go in and train a heap of Somali fishermen in Puntland to do things to help to ward off um, you know, the, the international predation. So they trained them in things like uh, locating vessels at sea using the internet, uh, operating satellite phones, GPS equipment, um, boarding moving ships, you know, all these skills that are actually extremely useful for all Coast Guard skills. Coast Guard skills, but yeah. when this company um, yeah. went out of business and left Somalia, all of a sudden these people lost their jobs and many of them went on to become some of the most famous pirates. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing which, uh, of course, you know, dominates uh, the Somalia. Um, um, security scene and indeed the rest of East Africa is an expanding problem in East Africa is uh, uh, the growth of uh, radical Islam and the group Al-Shabaab uh, and yet uh, Somaliland uh, seems to be immune to you know the rest of the region uh, to this kind to the kind to uh, Al-Shabaab violence why is this well, Somaliland did have a few attacks by Shabab. There was one against the UN compound in 2008, and then there was an attack in 2013 that was uncovered, like in the final hours of preparation. So they do have a presence, but yeah, you're right. They haven't they haven't done any of their big attacks there, and um, there's a lot of controversy about this point. It's, at least there was when I was there sort of around 2012, 2015, people asking the question, well, why is that? Why have they, um, why have they been seemingly immune from attacks? And one of the theories that was doing the rounds was that there might be some sort of tacit agreement between members of the Somaliland elite um, and members of Shabab. Now, that's, that was obviously a very controversial point that um, many members of the government staunchly denied, of course. The other argument that got raised a lot, and I think that has um, gained more traction, is that, well, it's actually harder to operate in Somaliland because of the level of community responsiveness to issues like terrorism and piracy, that people in Somaliland want international recognition so much that they don't want to do things that would perceive them to be bad international citizens. And so there's a strong desire on the part of the community to report this sort of behavior and to, to stamp it out locally. So there's, there's very differing opinions on, on that. Interesting. So let's, let's look now at how Somaliland found peace, if you like. Um, now, Many of the things that you know, commentators or some commentators ascribe to being, you know, as contributing to the Somali uh, uh, com conflict, you know, like the clan structure and some in, in, intrinsically uh, uh, violent uh, aspect to the Somali nature, supposedly, are also present, of course, in Somaliland. Um, and yet Somaliland managed to end its war and find peace. How did that happen? <laughs> Again, I think the cleanest point of comparison between the two places is the nature and the degree of international intervention in uh, that both experienced. And the fact that Somaliland was very unusually detached from international power structures. So I'm not just talking about aid, even though that's the title of the book, because otherwise the title would have been too long. Um, but I'm talking about international money. So they didn't have access to international loans from the IMF, which meant that they had no debt that needed to be serviced, but also they had no access to legal international weapons trade, um, which has a big impact on a government's capacity um, to wage violence on the capacity of militias to be formed. But I think also probably most importantly, there was no party that was trying to either end or benefit from Somaliland's wars. And that's actually extremely unusual in the contemporary era to not have external parties who are trying, whether tacitly or overtly, to benefit from a war. Because Somaliland wasn't recognized, it wasn't seen as a particularly consequential part of the world. Um, geostrategic concerns looked pretty different 30 years ago to how they look now. It's a very different story now, and it's in a very politically and economically pivotal part of the world. But that wasn't so much the case 30 years ago. 
And the lack of international involvement, which again stemmed largely from this lack of international interest, frankly, meant that uh, unlike the places that get targeted by international peace building, international state building interventions, the process that unfolded in Somaliland to end the violence evolved without any explicitly um, explicit expectations of how it should look. There were no schedules that needed to be met and there was no technical indicators of success. The clan conferences that I've referred to before, they took as long as they needed to take. Sometimes this meant they took many months and there was lots of starts and stops. There's one great story of the beginning of the conference in Bodoma, which is probably the most important one in 1993, being delayed for quite some time because of political wrangling between some of the, some of the key elites. And so people, there was a, a week dedicated to just Quran recitations. Like you can never imagine that happening in, in something that is being overseen or presided over by the UN or others in the international community. And you also had um, you know, the chair people to the conferences, they would fall ill in order to allow time and political space for people to come together outside of the formal space of the, of the conferences. Mm. But another... So, so, I mean, so they had their own, they would set their own pace in negotiations, mm -hmm. but also, and crucially, as you made the point, um, there was no external cash mm. you know, to be made by continuing the war. And so much of uh, uh, the energy that goes into, uh, into conflict, um, which is all about money, the loss of it is about money, uh, just simply was absent. Yeah, and the peace process was also lo locally funded as well. So there was one of the conferences took about five months. There was 2,000 delegates and it was hosted by the Gadabursi clan. And everyone there knew, you know, hey, this was an extraordinary expense that they were putting into this process. But they knew that reciprocity was somewhere down the line going to be expected. So don't waste time. This is local resources going into a local process. Now, I mentioned that there was about $4 billion that was poured into the southern parts of Somalia by the US and the UN in the 90s. Other than about $100,000, there was nothing that went into Somaliland's peace conference. And one thing that I find fascinating about this is that even the mention of the $100,000 is something that raises controversy within Somaliland. They gave a public talk there in 2015, and there was quite a few people there who'd read a previous piece that I'd written, which mentions this figure of $100,000. And a number of people were really pushing me on it. Like, where did you get this figure about? We don't think that there was anything. There was nothing because it's such an important part of the national narrative of their independence that they did this with no aid. Amusingly, the person who actually delivered the $100,000 um, from the donors happened to be in the audience as well. Um, but just the idea that even $100,000 was a point of controversy that because it upset this narrative of, of independence was really fascinating to me. I mean, there are obviously some cases um, where actually international assistance or external uh, um, influence and assistance has helped to end conflicts. I'm thinking now, for example, in Northern Ireland, the personal intervention by Bill Clinton was absolutely critical in bringing people together. Um, um, but this, this is a, uh, a really interesting case where actually the, uh, the absence of international intervention was critical in terms, in terms of ending the war. Um, but it's one thing to find peace, uh, uh, quite another to sustain it, um, as Somaliland has done now for some 25 years, I think. Um, how has it achieved that, especially given the the fragility of the state's institutions, you know, such as police and judiciary, et cetera? This, that's a great question. And, and this is where I think I really deviate from the mainstream literature on Somaliland and also on peace building more generally, because this tends to credit either the state apparatus that gets formed in Somaliland for being able to perform this maintenance of political order, or it's credited to the clan or it gets credited to what's referred to as Somaliland's hybrid system, which is probably best understood as like this fruitful combination of the clan and formal organizations. What I think is really doing this work though, was a deeper understanding of their own precarity and the ease with which their situation could become like Mogadishu's again. And so in a sense, 
think the ability to sustain peace has not been so much despite the fragility of its institutions, but actually in many ways because of them, because of the fragility of their <laughs> institutions. And we could look at um, the 2003 presidential elections as an example of this. There was initially a vote, a difference between the two candidates of just 80 votes out of 500,000 that were cast. So as you can imagine, this was really tense and people, many people were expecting that there could be a violent outcome. The rhetoric from both sides of the, of the election turned to being very much about not following Mogadishu and seeing that if they did choose to mobilise for violence, that's where it could end. So you've got this example of Mogadishu being used in a very real and tangible way to stave off the possibility of violence in Somaliland. And of course, it did, it did pass peacefully. So what I take from this is that the ability of state or formal institutions to sustain the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, which is, of course, the, the standard definition of a state, but it's also the standard um, understanding of the way that political order um, is sustained. It's just not true in the case of Somaliland. And I think you could actually argue, and I do argue, that it's the weakness of its institutions that gets used kind of quite counterintuitively as a reason to sustain the peace. I think, I, I think your, your comments on um, the lack of monopoly of force that you made in your book, um, one of the many insights, um, which by the way, I thoroughly enjoyed, <laughs> um, I think was one of the um, most, you know, something that was really interesting to me. And I mean, can you have any examples of how it actually works? How does, how do, how does policing justice actually work? So I can give you a, a really interesting example of a case that took place when I was there in 2012, um, a conflict that the government got involved in, but not in the way that, you know, anyone in you or my background would expect them to do. So there was a case when uh, a, a, someone was killed by, a, you know, a, a member of a, a clan um, and the clan elders, you know, the, the perpetrator, the killer's clan elders didn't try to, or didn't succeed, I'm, I'm not sure, in capturing the suspect, okay? Now that's a customary requirement for inter-clan negotiations to, to start. So this creates a deadlock and um, people were expecting that a revenge killing by the victim's clan was probably on the cards. It's here that the, the Minister of Internal Affairs steps in and he steps in to try and break the deadlock and he issues an ultimatum to the offender's clan to either capture the offender, capture the, the murderer, um, so that investigations can take place, um, or negotiations rather, or they're all going to be arrested. At no time though, did the minister actually suggest that the government forces would attempt to intervene in order to investigate or arrest the suspect. The suspect was free and uh, you know, he wasn't recaptured. And so the minister carried good on the ultimatum and, and briefly arrests the elders from, from his clan. Once they were released, the minister then explains that what he had done, he had done in order to persuade the victim's clan members to delay their revenge um, and to convince the elders um, from the, the murderer's clan that, that it was up to them to prosecute the crime. So what we see is that the government authorities in this story, they have played a mediating role, but they're using their coercive capacity to detain the elders and kind of you know, twist their arms into negotiating a solution that is actually going on outside of the government's judicial institutions. Um, they are not trying to divert the dispute into its own jurisdiction. They're completely fine with it happening elsewhere. And I think that this reveals that the government hasn't established a monopoly on the legitimate use of force that I think a lot of people presume it to, and they sort of hold up as being the reason that Somaliland has been able to sustain its peace. But I think it also shows that it's not necessarily actively seeking that either. How important, so just moving on a little, how important is uh, the idea that what they call the independence discourse, you know, they're continually seeking of independence uh, to their maintenance of peace. That's, yeah, that's, that's a controversial issue. Some people in Somaliland were quite open and said, look, the lack of independence has been a blessing in disguise. Others completely disagree with that, I hasten to add, but 
but some see it as this really awkward dilemma or even paradox that it has been the lack of independence that has helped them to sustain peace and that if they get independence, then there will be a lot more international intervention uh, or international money, international access flowing in, and that could upset the Apple Court. But that is, that is a matter of huge debate within Somaliland. But the idea that Somaliland was able to negotiate and maintain its peace in considerable part because of its independence, not only from Somalia, but also from the international community is a really powerful one. Even though it's really important to point out the idea that it actually doesn't have any money flowing in from the international community now is not true. There's UN trucks all over the place. There's lots and lots of foreign money flowing in there. But for the first 10 years, that really wasn't the case. And so it's become part of the, their national narrative. Absolutely. So uh, I'm, I'm going to move now on to sort of really our, our last question. Um, uh, as you've explained, uh, Somaliland's uh, peace is largely born out of a reaction to its own war um, and to justify its claims to independence, you know, by showing it's peaceful and different to Mogadishu and the rest of Somalia. Um, it engaged its own social structures and traditions to build the mechanisms for peace. It was, a, it was uh, left to do that um, uh, by the international community. And the very weakness of its formal state institutions um, helps to sustain the peace. Um, now, at face value, to me, these look like a very specific recipe for peace that wouldn't necessarily be immediately transferable elsewhere. So how can the lessons uh, of Somaliland be more broadly applicable? Mm, good one. Um, so first, I think the fact that Somaliland was so unusually detached from the international system in just about every way during its first formational years, that is like it's about its first 10 or so, um, and the years of its peace process, I think really highlights just how possible autonomous development or autonomous peace building really is. And this is something that international discourses about security and about development just profoundly ignore. There's almost always this assumption that external involvement in processes of peace or state building are invariably useful. You've just got to tinker with them to make them a bit better, but they're always useful. And I don't think that this is necessarily true. And I, I talk a lot to, to Yemenis. That's another area that I, I cover a lot. And one of the things that I'm hearing a lot now is the, the frustrated view that if they were left to their own devices, they'd actually be quite capable of negotiating a workable settlement to the conflict. Like that's, we can get into that later, but it's a very, very strongly felt sentiment. Mm. But going, going deeper, I think that the hope of finding directly applicable lessons that can be transported between cases. And we see this a lot, like I'm, I'm often asked about, you know, what are the, what are the lessons that we can take from Somaliland and apply elsewhere? I think that in one way, it kind of reveals this desire within the scholarly and practitioner community to find specific social outcomes that can be engineered. But this often doesn't work very well. We tend to be fairly bad at, um, at, at social engineering. So I guess what I'm, suggesting is that we look instead at the much bigger picture lessons that Somaliland's experience does contain. One of the most obvious of which is that local context, local agency, local identity is invariably part of any political process, right? The social world is never linear and despite this development models, state building models are very linear. But I think that's kind of it's a bit of a dissatisfying answer, you know, that context matters, so we've got to let context happen. It doesn't really tell us that much that is directly transferable, other than there's probably going to be unintended consequences. But for a long time, when I was first starting to write the book, I basically thought that that was where the book story was going to end, that external intervention inhibits contextually important people and contextually important processes from emerging and that the overriding presumption that international intervention is a valuable contribution is, is limiting to development processes. Now that's a thread that runs through the book, but then I realized that there was something that had been staring me in the face throughout all the field work that I did. And that was that this is, I think, a story about a lot more than just the importance of local, allowing local context to determine the development process. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think that what Somaliland's experience helps us to see is that many of the things that development and security scholars and, and practitioners have so long presumed about the way that peace and order emerges and endures are actually fundamentally wrong. Uh, the usual assumption, I think, is that political order increases it's basically in, in lockstep with the increases that are made to the capacity of either state or state-like institutions. But what Somaliland shows us is that this presumption can actually be flipped on its head. And if it can be flipped on its head, and it can be, I think, because the precarity of its institutions also underpin its political order, then we were never looking at a causal relationship to begin with. So my claim here is that political order is never uh, actually a simple function of either state or state-like institutional capacity, but it's far more, it, it's about the far more slippery discourses that give these institutions life. And so this suggestion really challenges the common sense causal relationship between institutions and order. Because if either, either the strength of an institution or the weakness of an institution can provide a foundation of order, then, then there was never really a causal relationship between them. It, it's correlative perhaps, but it's not causal. And this has really important implications because, beyond Somaliland, because if weak institutions can also support order under certain conditions, uh, in this case, discursive conditions, then we see that just how inherently fluid this relationship is. Um, and this shows us as well, just how susceptible to rapid change in our institutions are. And I think that this is the, the point that I would really like people to take away from all this and that I'll end on, is that the institutions and states that we in the West tend to label as being fragile, are actually a lot closer to our own robust, effective, constraining, whatever you want to call them, institutions than we like to imagine. And it's when the norms and the discourses that give these institutions legitimacy deteriorate, as I think we're seeing happen across the world now, things can change very quickly because we were never actually dealing with a simple causal relationship that we thought that we were. The relationship is always mediated by ideas and the ways that people express these ideas in language and practice and language and ideas change really fast. So I think that we do well to understand them as the real foundation for peace and political order. Well, I, I, I enjoyed your analysis about how um, the, inter the very presence of the international community and everything that it brings with it uh, in um, local politics substantially changes the local political scene and indeed can undermine the legitimacy of what are perceived uh, as traditionally as being uh, legitimate le leaders and, and, and orders. Um, and that's something that we simply don't understand how we impact. And the other uh, aspect about aid, which, uh, uh, which I reflect from my West African experience um, uh, that came out of your book was that um, since most aid is channeled through government, local governments, it makes um, taking ownership of that government really rewarding, which is the reason why we had so many coups and continue to do so uh, in, in some African countries, uh, because there is money to be made out of it. Um, and absent that aid, there just wasn't that incentive to try and overthrow government in Somaliland. And I think that's a really, really interesting uh, um, um, insight. Is there anything you'd like to add or before we throw open to, to, to Q&A? Uh, look, I think that was very comprehensive. Thank you. Let's let's open it up to, to questions from. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, okay, Alistair, over to you. We, we, we've got some great questions coming in. We'll get through as many as we can. I'm, I'm going to just take sort of two together to, to kick off. If if a lack of international aid had helped Somaliland, can a lack of international recognition damage its peace and, and progress? So so leading from that, what are the prospects for Somaliland obtaining international recognition? And does Eritrea's separation from Ethiopia provide a relevant precedent? <laughs> um, 
what are the prospects of it gaining international recognition? Look, if the, the recognition of Eritrea and the recognition of South Sudan was greeted with great fanfare uh, within Somaliland because it was seen as being, look, this is Pandora's box being opened. We can start to recognize secessionist entities. The difference between those cases though was that uh, the secession was signed off in the capital. Um, whereas Somalia will not sign off on, on secession with Somaliland. There, there has been no indication that they will do that. So I think the inter that would require then the international community leading on taking it through the UN, which I just don't see happening. Um, th there was a question as well about uh, what recognition might mean for Somaliland, a really hotly debated um, question. I mean, the obvious answer is that people would be thrilled because this is very much what their entire international posturing and discourse is about. But I think um, I certainly picked up um, very clear concerns about what would happen. And part of the tension within the discourse is that it does recognize that, you know, we did this by our own hand. We negotiated our peace under a tree while Somalis did it in a five-star hotel in Nairobi many people realize that that is likely to be upset if and when international recognition was to come. So there is a, a sense of trepidation, I think, as well. Um, but of course, that, that can get, um, there is also a great enthusiasm just for the idea of recognition. But I, I often wonder if it became more likely to be a reality, how people would feel about that. Absolutely. You'd, you'd mentioned Yemen, and an obvious question is, which has been upvoted, how has the war in Yemen affected Somaliland? Well, in many ways, um, principally that just the strategic nature of the region has just been amplified. I mean, it, it has been um, increasing for quite some time, particularly with the, uh, the Chinese involvement and Belt and Road, uh, the Emirates wanting anyway to expand their presence in ports across, across the region but also in the possibility of Somaliland being um, providing military bases um, for the war in Yemen. So it's, it's just amplified the sense that this is a strategically important area. There's also been a, a lot of a flow of, um, of refugees between the two, which was always the case, but it was pre previously in the opposite direction. But now you're having Yemenis going over to Somalia more than was ever the case before. Um, but based on your research in the region, what would you say the necessary conditions that the international community should consider before contemplating whether or not to support the potential division of an existing state? Look, I think you've got to base it on what the local population wants. And I think that is part of the reason, that is the reason mainly why the international community is unwilling to lead this. They want it, you know, if it was to be led by Mogadishu and Hargeisa, then that would be a different story. And that is what happened in, in the two previous cases that I referred to before. But I think that nobody has the appetite or the interest to, to lead a process like this. So I think until there is settlement between the two capitals, little will change. And certainly when, when sorry, just to, uh, to intrude, when I was working in Mogadishu, uh, the, uh, there was, absolutely convinced that the Somali landers, if I can call them that, were Somalis. Oh, um, yes. Uh, and there, there's, 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 it, it's just something they wouldn't even consider. Yep. I, I think I'm right in saying that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, people, yes, it, it is considered treason by, by many Somalis, the idea that they are calling for their own state. Yeah, it's, it's not something that I can ever imagine Mogadishu saying yes to. Yeah. I'd read one comment that women had played a particular role in, in solving some of the, the problems. Could you just briefly talk a little bit more about that and how that came about? An extremely important role. And I'm sorry I didn't get a, a chance to go into it um, previously. But look, women were, they weren't formally involved in most of the negotiations. In fact, they were cut out. And But what they did do is like women so often do is much of the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So they were involved in basically cajoling the men to take part in the negotiations. And some of them have told me how, you know, we stopped cooking. Um, we stopped taking care of the kids until they said that they would go back and negotiate in good faith. Um, and so they also, women have a really interesting structural role in clan based societies like Somalia's. 
um, in that one, when a woman gets married, she's not, uh, she does not take on, uh, she does not lose the clan of her birth. So she becomes a member of her husband's clan, but she doesn't lose the clan of her birth. So she's a member of two clans, whereas men are, men are only the, a member of the clan of their birth, which means that they can perform. And I, I'm always a bit hesitant of giving such a structuralist answer, but so take this with something of a grain of salt. But um, women, because of, they maintain two clan identities, in times of conflict, they are the behind the scenes negotiators because they can move between the various clans and it's just a normal thing. And they are very much involved in trying to bring, um, bring the warring parties together. And their, their conflict, uh, their, their contribution rather, was, was extraordinary and is increasingly being credited more as being so. That's uh, really interesting, good to pick out. So if, if local social processes and structure is so paramount, uh, do, do you see a role for external actors in, in peace building? To an extent, yes, but I think that the most useful thing that they can probably do, and I guess I'm thinking this very much with my eyes on Yemen, which is my other um, real interest, is that they could provide, they can provide political space. You know, they can provide, um, the ability for people to come together without, um, without so much pressure, I think, and sort of hold back the tide of other international actors that might want to be involved and sort of really try to, to protect a level of political space for, uh, for local negotiations to occur. But they need to accept that this is a really bumpy process. It happens in fits and starts over long periods of time but that time needs to be protected. And I think that's a role that they can usefully play, but that's typically not what they do. They go much, much further than that. Absolutely. Um, uh, I'm sorry, if I could just also add, um, I mean, there ha obviously have been cases uh, where conflicts have been brought to a close with international assistance. There's, there's obviously, as you said earlier, no silver bullet, no lesson that is absolutely specific. Mm. Um, in you know, Sierra Leone, for example, the war wouldn't have ended without Nigeria's assistance, um, uh, nor indeed in the end with the United Nations bringing the two sides together to uh, uh, oversee the, uh, 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 the disarmament process. Mm. Um, I don't think that the, the, the local Syrians will be able to do that by themselves. I don't think um, so there, there, there are obviously uh, uh, times when external assistance might be necessary and other times when it were really unhelpful. Would you, would you agree with that as a, a generalisation, Sarah, or do you think I've gone too far? Look, cautiously, <laughs> yes, but I think what gets us into a lot of trouble is, and I'm not talking about you, I'm, I'm saying more generally, the presumption that international assistance will be of use. And so now we start our peace building process and this gets driven by this, you know, by this entity or the UN or whatever. And I think that is profoundly damaging. And I think it often happens way too soon before there has been sort of a chance for, um, for local actors to, to really come together with something on the line, you know, with something serious on the line. So I, I don't want to say that it is, it is never useful. I mean, you know, there are no silver bullets and there are no cookie cutter answers, neither saying never any assistance or always assistance is obviously going to, to answer this. But allowing space for the political and contextual complexities to sort of work their way, I think is really, really important. And the international community for all sorts of structural reasons has real difficulties in being able to see that through. The way that the, way that, um, the UN and other INGOs and foreign ministries and aid agencies are structured, you know, you're there for a year, you're there for two years, you pick, you tick off things on your, um, you know, to, to advance your career. Um, you are not rewarded for being in one place for a long period of time and really getting to know it. You are rewarded for being a generalist. So that tends to mean that people um, from the international side lack the level of contextual in, um, detail about a specific case. So it's all these sorts of things that can, can lead into it. But no, I would, I'm not saying that there is one completely right or one completely wrong answer. And there, there can be a role for external assistance sometimes in, in bringing people together. Just following on briefly, Sarah, from your, your comment on, on women and, and how that works with the, uh, the clans. Are, are the clans in Somaliland much different to those in Puntland, for example, or other, other parts of Somalia, to, 
Yeah, look, sometimes people will argue that the reason that Somaliland has had peace is because they're all from, the, the majority is Sark. You know, the, the, the majority is from one clan. And that's something of a factor, but then keep in mind that throughout the 90s, it was the Isak subclans that were engaged in a, just a terrible, terrible violence. So the idea that they all came together because they were Isak just, I think, doesn't, doesn't hold um, historical, um, the historical evidence doesn't, doesn't show it. But um, so yeah, there is a, there is a dominant um, clan within Somaliland, but structurally, no, very, very similar. Do, do, you, do you have a feeling for what role the um, international diaspora is playing in, in promoting economic growth and, and how, how much influx is there back from overseas to, to Somaliland? The majority of people's incomes come from the diaspora. Like that, that is how money largely comes into the country. Um, people are sending remittances is in. Uh, there's, no, there's no definitive um, estimation of what that is, but it seems like it probably at least, let's say, between 500 and 1,000% of what the government's annual budget would be. It's huge. I mean, that is, that is how... Uh, many Somalilanders and Somalis and, and Africans and Middle Eastern, you know, it, it's very common, but this is how many of them um, have uh, their livelihoods. And, and is, um, is international tourism playing any sort of role there? International tourism? Yeah. Uh, it's tiny, um, but it is, you know, there, there are certainly people who go there for, for tourism, but it, it's, it's, it's a small part of, of their economy. They would like it to grow, and it's great. We should go. Absolutely. Um, well, can I, just coming back to the to the clan conferences because there's there's quite a lot of interest in this. Did did any natural leader em, emerge out of that? Because the, the, the situation in a different drawn with with Lebanon, for example, where there are you know people tribal clan uh, differences that, that there's no leader rise yet. But was that the case in Somaliland? There were natural leaders coming out of this. Yes, um, and also there was the second president, President Egal, was a capable leader, and he was also he was very good at getting money out of the wealthy merchants and at using that to reasonably developmental ends. Um, so that that is a that is a difference. They also had um, a a group of people who were reasonably well educated from one particular secondary school, and these the, the alumni from this institution go on to form the majority or let's say about a third of every cabinet that Somaliland has ever had. Like they're very, very influential and active within the bureaucracy. And just to come out to the economy, what, what is the main economy there in Somaliland? I mean, you may have covered it, but a couple of questions as to... It, it's livestock is the main one, but then there's lots of people circling around looking for a, uh, for oil because it's believed that there are large oil deposits um, both within the country, but also mainly off the coast. And so if that happens, if there are large oil deposits discovered, I think all bets are off. Everything changes if, if they are proven and they are extractable. Yeah. And I just, I mean, you, you talked to well, Richard had raised the question about piracy and obviously some, you know, incredible seamanship among the people there to, to go do what they were doing, albeit nefarious. So ha has, has the Coast Guard um, come back in any shape or form as a source of employment for them? No, not really. Um, and even in Somaliland, where there was very limited uh, incidents of piracy, it did, it did happen on a number of occasions, but it was very limited. They don't have, or at least when I was doing my last interviews around this a few years ago, they didn't have a functioning Coast Guard. It was basically the Coast Guard didn't have boats or they had tiny, tiny little boats. They relied on reports from members of the community. You know, hey, I think this guy's organizing something, do something. It wasn't a matter of them patrolling out at sea. Absolutely. Well, we're coming to the to the end of our time maybe maybe we can squeeze in a couple of brief uh, last last question but um the the situation in ethiopia the some of the unrest there is is that having an impact across the border well yes i mean they share they share a border so that is a flick uh, affecting um you know some of the some of the um the crossovers there but i couldn't give you any more details than that it's something that's a little bit out of 
out of my area. Yeah, sure. No, no problem. Well, maybe, maybe we can get one last question and, and apologies to anyone if we can't get yours in, but we've covered a lot, but just on, on the, on the whole sort of peace process, what was there uh, any type of formal truth and reconciliation structure going on there? Or was it coming from the, the clans? It, no, not really. I mean, it, 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 was a, it was a very open and inclusive process at the clan conferences, and they explicitly made a, um, a promise that they weren't going to go after people who had done them wrong in, um, during the conflict. There's a, there's a Somali term, hale dale, uh, which I may be mispronouncing, um, that is basically saying that there will be, um, if there are no, if, if the the losses from war are so incalculable, you know, so huge that they can't be calculated and that there cannot be reciprocity. You've just got to move on. All right. Well, thank you. That, that brings us to our, our six o'clock close and we'll try and sort of stick to our, our times, but um, thank you, Sarah, very much. And Richard, um, indeed, for another fantastic in conversation. Thank you to everyone watching uh, for your interest and, and your participation with some really great questions. So um, from us here in, in lockdown in Victoria, uh, if you're outside, um, please stay safe and well, and thank you for your interest. We'll see you again. So um, thanks again very much, Richard and Sarah, and we'll, we'll be in touch. and. Um, so I'll send out the link to the uh, discount flyer for the book. Please buy a copy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you for hosting me and thanks for great questions, Richard. Thank and you. Good luck to everyone in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.